Last year, uh, our uh, good friend Frank Sinatra was going to make another picture. Before we talk about that picture, go back and take a look at the history, a little bit of the history of World War I. We find that in World War I, many hundreds of thousands of American boys gave their lives. They gave their lives bravely, bravely, as men of valor, as men of honor, gave their lives to the, in order to preserve the freedom that we have in this land. Out of all the men who died thusly, one man, and one man only, was executed for cowardly desertion. His name? Private Slovak. And so what did Frank Sinatra intend to produce? A picture by the name of, you guessed it, the execution of Private Slovak. Now, out of all the stories that they could have told, why that one story? At this time, when our men in uniform need to be proud of that uniform, when we, the American people, need to be proud of our boys wearing that uniform, why tell the story of, of an individual who make us ashamed of that uniform or ashamed of the men who wear it? An accident? And was it an accident that when they selected a scriptwriter for that, they selected Albert Maltz, who has been writing for the communists for years? Of course it wasn't an accident. Why? Because the motion picture screen is to the communists part of cybernetic warfare, a means of communication. And what better way? People go to the movies for entertainment. They don't go to the movies expecting a message. But the message has been there. I know that many of you perhaps who have gone to the movies in the last two or three years have noticed a large number of pictures having to do with uh, men of armed surf, uh, forces. And uh, as you observe these pictures, what do you find? Pictures about the Navy, the Army, the Marines, the Coast Guard. Oh, they're a lot of fun. They're usually in the, in the form of comedies, so-called comedies. The officers, of course, are pictured as great big jokes to be laughed at. They're ridiculous people. Not much sense, really. No brains. They're comics. Uh, uh, certainly not meant to be honored or obeyed or respected. Or if they're not pictured in that form, then they're very cruel and inhuman and unjust and they needlessly risk the lives of their men and sacrifice their men for their own personal ambitions or whatnot. Pretty bad lot altogether, according to Hollywood. What about the men in uniform, the, the GIs? Oh, they're a pretty, pretty bad bunch, too. They're unkempt and slovenly and... Uh, uh, or they're, uh, they're a criminal type who's, uh, who can't live in civilian life for the army is the only escape for them, you see. My wife and I dropped in to, to a movie just a short time ago. After we got to the movie, we found this, the name of the picture was The Enemy Below. The Enemy Below. What was this all about? Well, it was a picture of a sub-destroyer. And uh, oh, it was a very interesting picture. It was in technicolor and very well done, well directed, well acted. But what about the story? Well, the officer on this ship, the sub-destroyer, was the most unhappy man you'd ever seen in your life. He was perfectly miserable in his job. He hated his work. The only thing he looked forward to was the day he could get out of the, uh, get out of the service. As, as, as sub-destroyers, they were very unsuccessful for the whole picture, running some 45 minutes, which uh, was supposed to have taken several days of action sub got away clean. I mean, they fired hundreds of these death bombs without any, any luck at all. They were an awful bad bunch of uh, men, really. The American crew, why the American crew, the sailors on there were, were a pretty sloppy bunch. They were very disrespectful to their commanding officer. By comparison, the Germans in the sub below, under a dictatorship, why, they were full of snap and spit and polish and discipline. It was terrific. Under a dictatorship, you see, here was a contrast. Here was a crew they could be proud of. We Americans had to sit there and say, gee, our boys are <laughs> not very good lot, are they? Here's the key, however. If you had stopped any person leaving the theater that night after the picture, and if you had asked them, how'd you like the picture tonight? they say, great, great, wonderful, boy, it was filled with action and technicolor and, and, and shot and shell and all. You know, it was a very exciting and interesting picture. But if you had asked any parent leaving the theater that night, uh, tell me, would you want your son to be in the Navy? They'd say that's the last place in the world they'd want on a baby. Or if you'd asked any young man leaving the theater night, that night, tell me, would you want to join the Navy? He'd look up at you and say, hey, do you think I'm nuts? You see, cybernetic warfare. 
the manipulation and control of information based upon Soviet psychiatry to plant ideas favorable to the Soviet Union and disastrous to the defense of the United States. This has happened over and over and over again. There's one picture that really should have been seen if you haven't seen it. For a, for a beautiful example of the communist message on the motion picture screen, people should have seen the motion picture on the beach. Beautiful example of cybernetic warfare. Beautiful example. Now, these things cannot, cannot happen by accident. Now, as you know, I worked on the staff of the New York Herald Tribune for eight years. We in the newspaper field and newspaper people here today know that we have had a fantastic battle for control of our press. It's a battle still going on, a fierce fight. We know that the communists moved into the newspaper guild. We know that in New York City, for example, the communists controlled the newspaper guild, grabbed control of it. And it was a tremendous battle before, it took three years before we were finally able to kick, uh, kick the communists out of control. Uh, a newspaper man knows that we have had problems and still have problems. This is, this is no secret. Why? Why? Because newspapers are communists or publishers are communists? Of course not. Why in the world do you find communists in the publishing field? Because they've been sent there, because this is a means of communication, of controlling information. What does a communist have to do in a newspaper? Does he necessarily have to write pro-communist stories? No, indeed. If he's sitting on a particular desk in a paper, let's say a cable desk, he knows that coming into that cable desk every day in our leading newspapers are at least 10 times more news than that paper can carry. At least 10 times more than the paper can carry. So what does he have to do? All he has to do is use the wastebasket. Any story coming in on the foreign cables that are unfavorable to the Soviet Union, into the wastebasket. Any stories coming in from, from the foreign cables which are favorable to the Soviet Union, onto the city desk. All you have to do is pull the right plugs, you see, and push the right buttons, and you can manipulate and control information. Read the book Red Star Over Cuba. Beautiful example of cybernetic warfare in action. The American people were misled concerning Cuba because we received the wrong information concerning Castro and his communist backers in Cuba. Wrong information. Herbert Matthews, one of the prime reasons for that misinformation is still on the staff of the New York Times today. Why, I cannot understand. I do not know. That is something the New York Times will have to reply to. What about radio and television? We have in New York City at the present time a very fine group of, of radio and television individuals. But let me tell you that there is a desperate fight for control, a desperate battle for control going on in New York City right at the radio and television headquarters right now. The anti-communist group is called AWARE, A-W-A-R-E. And right now my friends in AWARE tell me that they don't know how the issue is going to be resolved Right now, it's about a 50-50 chance that the anti-communists will be able to win and, uh, and hang on to uh, what there is there of our radio and television communications uh, circuit. When you see the film strip, uh, Communism, on the map, what do you find? You'll find that there are a very small number of unions in this country today still controlled by the communists. What's one of the top unions? Communications Workers Union. Communications Workers Union kicked out of the CIO because of its communist control. Why? Manipulation and control of information. Uh, hundreds of examples could, could be given over and over again. Now, as we said before, a great deal of this may be simply not that you change a story or angle a story, but simply that you leave certain information out. You don't have to go any further than your own Los Angeles Times to find examples of this. Now, why? I know there has been much controversy uh, stimulated recently because of the uh, Times uh, material on the John Birch uh, clubs. I'm not going to take one side or the other at this time, but only I will make a prediction. And that is that the editorial, which will be published this coming uh, Sunday, and if there is a uh, Times man here, he can bring it back to headquarters and tip him off that this is what I said. I predict now that that editorial concerning the John Birch uh, Society will be against the John Birch Society. Now, uh, why? Because on the basis of, of previous history of that particular newspaper, 
When at any time have they ever promoted or boosted or sponsored any anti-communist organization? I can't remember of any time. H have, they ever, have they ever boosted, uh, uh, for example, the Cardinal Menzendi Foundation, which is doing a great job? They have hundreds of chapters across the, across the country that time. Have they ever had a good word to say about the Cardinal Menzendi group? I don't think so. Cybernetic warfare, you see. In other words, if you can cut off from the people any information about these things, what better results? You don't have to say anything pro-communist in the paper. Let me give you another example. Two weeks ago, two weeks ago, in Washington, a bill was brought before the Senate. This bill is the Freedom Academy Bill, Senate Bill 822. This bill calls from the establishment of a Freedom Academy or a Freedom Institute by our government. It's one of the great steps forward. This has been in the mill now for two years. It was brought before the Senate last year and debated for three days on the floor of the Senate. They conducted hearings for two weeks. Two weeks hearings were conducted. They had top people testify before that uh, committee and, and in these hearings. Uh, people like David Sarnoff, uh, Daniel James, who was a leading authority in the subject of communism, a student, uh, General C.B. Uh, Capel, Deputy Director of Central Intelligence. Now, this bill would set up a Freedom Academy or a Freedom Institute. A Freedom Institute would be on the same academic and intellectual level as West Point or Annapolis, except that instead of training people in the art of military warfare, instead of training them in the art of naval warfare, it would train them in the art of political warfare, cold warfare economic warfare, propaganda warfare, training which our government does not provide at the present time. Our State Department people are sent out without any training, without any training. And so as Senator Tom Dodd pointed out, as I read yesterday, this is a case, for example, as, as in Cuba, a case of disorganized amateurs being sent out uh, up against organized professionals. Now, Senator Dodd, in his speech concerning this bill, had this to say. I would like to observe at the outset that this is a bill of extraordinary importance to the United States and the free world. In fact, the Judiciary Committee, in reporting the bill favorably, has described it as one of the most important ever introduced in Congress. I fully agree with this estimate. If anything, I consider it an understatement. I believe that the preservation of our freedom, the preservation of the free world as we know it, may ultimately depend on the enactment of this measure. Now, Senator Tom Dodd, Democrat of Connecticut, I think knows what he's talking about. Not one single line appeared in the Los Angeles Times concerning this debate, this bill, Senator Dodd's speech. The people here have not even heard that the bill exists. Cybernetic warfare, the cutting off of information which might possibly damage the communist criminal conspiracy. Now, if someone can explain how these things happen, I I'd be glad to hear the explanation. I cannot tell you how they happen. I can't tell you why they happen. All we can point out is this is a fact. This is a fact. Not a line appeared in the paper. I know that one young lady was talking to her just before we came in this morning concerning the communications union. And the fact that right now, right now, the Communications Workers Union, a union dominated controlled by the Communist Criminal Conspiracy, controls, controls all of the tie lines and the cables coming out of the Pentagon. And the question of this young lady was, well, well, how can this be? I wish I knew. I wish I knew. This is some kind of a strange insanity. All we can say is that most of it is because of apathy and difference and complacency. Our only encouragement is to thank God the American people are beginning to wake up and pretty soon, pretty soon, <laughs> the, the complaint is made, you know, many times that uh, we should recognize Red China so that we could know more about what's going on in Red China. Well, you don't have to recognize Red China to find out what's going on there. Besides, we would very much like to know what's, been go what's going on there, and for that reason, our government, our government has authorized 25 top 
newspaper writers and reporters in this country, given them permission, given them visas to go into Red China. Red China has refused to let them in. Refused to let them in. And again, in negotiations reported in today's papers, Red China has again turned down, has refused to let these reporters go behind the Iron Curtain. Now, this is very interesting because I tore out some tear sheets from a magazine. The date of this was January 31, 1961. Here is a report from Red China. Report from Red China. How in the world did this report show up when the, com when the communists refused to let our reporters into the country? Well, I, I wish the magazine who printed this article had explained what the reason was, because we find that the author of the article is a man by the name of Edgar Snow. Who's Edgar Snow? Edgar Snow was a member of the IPR, the Institute of Pacific Relations, cited as, a, as an agent of Soviet foreign policy. He was a writer for the magazine, Amerasia magazine, a communist magazine. He was one of the leading propagandists whose job it was to mislead and confuse the American people concerning communist activities in Red China. This was one of the men who assured us there was nothing wrong with these nice Chinese over there. They were just agrarian reformers. Edgar Snow, his wife, this is not reported in this, in this uh, foreword. Neither is it revealed in the foreword of this article that his wife, Nim Wales, who runs under another name by the name of Nim Wales, is an identified member of the Communist Criminal Conspiracy, so identified by sworn witnesses testifying under oath. Now, you know, I have no objection, none at all, for our American people to read communist propaganda so long as, as it is identified as such. We need to know, and we need to read, and we need to study communist propaganda, but it should be so labeled, accurately, honestly, and truthfully, and Look Magazine did not reveal that this man has been a Soviet propagandist for years and years and years, and there's only one reason he was allowed to go into Red China by the communists, because they knew that they could depend upon him to say exactly what they wanted him to say, and nothing else. Not the truth, but cybernetic warfare, the manipulation and control of information. Only that information you see that they want the American people to hear, cut off any information that they don't want the American people to know. Cybernetic warfare in action right now, today. Well, we mustn't take much more of your time except to say that uh, a key example of cybernetic warfare today have to do with uh, slave labor in the Soviet Union. We are being told now, oh, there's no more slavery in the Soviet Union. The uh, slave labor camps have been abolished. The people have been re released. Is that true? Here, here is a booklet called Stalin's Slave Camp. This was put out by the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions. All across this map, you will see tiny red dots. Looks like smallpox. Looks like smallpox. Each red dot signifies a slave labor or a concentration camp, each dot. Today, there are 10 millions of Russian people in those slave labor and concentration camps, 10 million. There are more concentration camps behind the Iron Curtain today than there were at the death of Stalin, more. Now, where do we get this information? We get it from the witnesses who have testified, and this is again why the House Committee and the Senate Committee need to be maintained, need to continue their work, because this is our source of information. As we have listened to the testimony of individuals who have escaped from behind the Iron Curtain, how do we know their stories are true? Let me read to you this paragraph. Some of these witnesses are highly educated. Others are simple, uninstructed peasants. Some are Russians, others are foreigners. Some are political, others are not. Some are pro-communist, others are anti-communist. Some are men, some are women, and some are children. Some talk one language, others talk another. Yet each in his own words and in his own way uh, brings the same story, beginning with a brutal arrest and separation of families, and recounts the same systematic police terror and tortures, the same mass transportation and cattle cars to distant places, leading to the same brutal system of mass slavery. Yes, these accounts give a single consistent picture. The Soviet empire is covered from end to end by a system of slavery, brutality, torture, and terror. 
Tests have been made. Tests have been made to prove the reliability of witnesses, persons who are unknown to each other, but who have been interned in the same camp at different times, have drawn identical plans of the camp layout and have given identical descriptions of the physical environs as well as of the slavery itself, their stories tallied in every detail. It is impossible to doubt the reliability of these witnesses. Now, in this battle for cybernetic warfare, this means we must keep the channels of communication open. We must maintain the House Committee on Un-American Activities as a source of truthful information. We must keep the Senate Investigating Committee open as a source of information. Information which we need desperately. One of the hoaxes of uh, communist propaganda is, of course, that the Russian people are communists. We read even some history books today carry misinformation about the Soviet Union and the Russian people. Remember always that the Russian people are not communists. <coughs> Remember that. This is very important. The Russian people are not communists. The Russian people are not our enemies. There's absolutely no quarrel between the Russian people and ourselves. None. Only 3% of the people of the Soviet Union are members of the communist criminal conspiracy. Only 3%. We, the Russian people and the American people, have a common enemy, and that enemy is the communist dictatorship. Now, why do we know this? Because of the very fact that there are 10 millions of Russian people in slave labor and concentration camps. Why? Because they're for communism? No, because they're against communism. Why did Stalin and Khrushchev, his first right-hand lieutenant, wipe out someplace between 12 and 15 millions of Russian people? A three-year period, 1930 to 33, because they were against communism. Why is it that some 20 millions of Chinese people have been ruthlessly exterminated in Red China? Because they're against communism. They're on our side. Right now, the people of the Congo are on our side. On our side. The Congolese people do not want communism. And yet, what do we find? We find the United Nations at, the at this time firing on our friends, the Congolese people, and protecting the communists in the Congo. Now, whose side are we on, or whose side is the United Nations on? We'd better start asking some very sharp questions. Now, I've had a wonderful opportunity since leaving the communist movement, being pulled out by the FBI, thank God, I, I wouldn't want to be in there today, as I told you last night. And despite the smear attacks made upon so-called informers by a writer to one of your local newspapers, I said what I said last night, not because this school needs any defense, it doesn't, as Dr. Schwartz said. But I did speak last night, and I speak again now for those who must remain silent. Those who are informing for the FBI today inside the communist criminal conspiracy. People whose jobs are the toughest in the world. And I would like to know of that particular writer if he'd want to exchange places with them. I'm sure he wouldn't. I'm sure he wouldn't. So I stand today before you humbly, because I know that there are others who will not receive any of these wonderful opportunities I've had. And I stand before you humbly, because, too, because I've met some of the people from behind the Iron Curtain. I know that there's a chapter here in Los Angeles of the anti-communist Russian underground organization. And wonderful people they are. There may be some here today. Wonderful people they are. Russian people who today have a very fine underground organization operating in Russia itself. That despite everything the communists have been able to do, Despite their cybernetic warfare, despite their brainwashing, despite their psychiatric uh, uh, tricks, uh, despite the torture and the terror and the slave labor camps and the killings, there are still people, Russian people, behind the Iron Curtain today, who do not believe in Khrushchev, who believe in God. There is an underground church behind the Iron Curtain. We have only one job to do, only one task. As Americans, if we really believe in freedom, if we really believe in freedom, we believe in freedom not only for ourselves, not only for our own people, but we must believe in the freedoms for all peoples in all parts of the world, and we must work constantly towards the day of the extinction of the communist enemy wherever it exists.